John Amplis has been in six films by George Romero. <laughs> six films! Six He's films! Been in six films! He was in movies six times! Six times! In order of those movies was Martin, then Dawn of the Dead, then Day of the Dead, then Knight Riders, then Creepshow, and then the dark half. He played he played the off-screen doppelganger of yes. Timothy Hutton. Played the off-screen doppelganger. So I feel like at best in the movie you might see his shoulder. Yeah. But he's really just uh, the when he's his acting partner. So when Timothy Hutton has to act with himself, when he's theoretically talking to his twin, he needs somebody to act against. So John Amplis was that guy for him. Yep. Which is actually which is pretty awesome, and uh, that's like the pretty seems like a fun kind of role to play because it's yeah. like it's a, there's no pressure on you from that kind of perspective, but you're gonna just like well, pretend I imagine, to be this like, guy. A lot of the roles that he got with Romero were kind of that role, right? Because a, a lot of them seemed like they were pretty un, like undefined, and he had a lot of room to sort of make them into what he wanted. Like yeah, for but, sure. Like, definitely Doctor Fisher in Day of the Dead, which mm-hmm. is probably his most iconic role, like the one you recognize him the most from, or as the body of the father. In the <laughs> right. Father's Day, simply because even though Martin was his biggest role, being the lead, you know, I think it's also just not one of the more popular or more well-known George Romero films. But hopefully, after this episode, that will change. Yeah. Well, I guess let's get into the interview. Hell yeah! Let's stop wasting time and let's welcome to the show actor John Amplis. <laughs> So we're here at Creature Feature Weekend. We're here with John Amplis, actor who's been in more George Romero movies than I than anyone, maybe. Almost, almost. Christine Forrest Romero actually did eight. I did six. You were beaten by two. Can you list them for us? Where'd you start? I started with Martin. Okay. With George. And you were Martin He's, in that, yeah? I was Martin, yeah. I was the guy, man. Okay. It was uh it turned out to be George's favorite movie. Oh. And mine, too, for obvious reasons. <laughs> sure. And uh, he saw me in a play I was doing at, uh, at the Pittsburgh Playhouse and um, talked to me afterwards and said, you know, I'm writing a script. Uh, but I had an older character in mind until I saw your work. Sure. And he went away, rewrote the script, and a couple of months later I got a call from him and he cast me. It was that simple. I'm going to pause real quick and kind of hit on something you just said, because we talked a little bit yesterday about this, and one of the things we talked about was theater actors oh, yeah. moving to film. And I wonder, yeah. and I was thinking about this last night afterwards, and I and I kind of hit on the idea that I wonder if some of these lower-budget filmmakers back in the day specifically sought out theater guys because they knew it was less time that they'd have to do takes. Well, maybe. I, I, I mean, I don't know what the reasons are always for why somebody casts somebody else, sure. but... I, I can tell you this, I think theater provides actors with discipline. It's really boot camp, and um, I always say, people ask me, is there a difference, what's the difference between film acting and theater acting, and I said, none. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, from a filmmaker like George Romero, who's, uh, his game is making low-budget, high-return movies, right? Yeah. Less takes equals less money, right? So if you're going with experienced actors who don't need a thousand takes, right? And like you said, you're a Pittsburgh guy, and George Romero loved to yeah. work local, right? Yeah. So he was all about empowering like the local scene, and uh, I think saving money, making oh, a he movie. Ab- he absolutely was. Yeah, I mean, I felt really fortunate um, to you know have an opportunity to star in a film, my first feature out of the gate, you know. Uh, Because I was just a young guy, you know, looking to be an actor, but... So it was really George who gave you, like, your first shot on film? In in feature film, yeah, for sure. That's amazing. I was 27. I mean, I was a little older than most most college kids at that time. I was a senior in college, because I was in the Army for three years before I went to school. I feel like that's another sort of weird Romeroism is that he seemed to gravitate towards people who had military experience a lot, right? Like he was, I mean, Savini was a, yeah, you know, Savini a military a photographer. photographer. Yeah. yeah, 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 Savini was. Uh, I'm sure there were several others, you yeah. know. That, well, talk to me, I, I'm, I hate to move it along so fast, but talk, right. talk to me a little bit about Dawn and Day of the Dead, because well, really, Dawn, I mean. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I got involved in Dawn because I just wanted to hang around. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to be part of the group, sure, you know, sure. part of the gang. Uh, and so I was allowed to do some casting. I, 
I was l fortunate enough to uh, bring him David Emge, who played F Flyboy, and and of course we did a lot of zombies. You yeah. Know, oh yeah. Which was not hard to find. No. They yeah, of course. Were, yeah. They would come to the mall and volunteer. You it know? feels like there's not a there's not a huge uh, there's not a huge criteria list for zombie no, actors. Like, no, no. Can not you in, lumber? Not in dawn. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Exactly. What I find impressive is uh, you actually may be the only person who appears twice in the of the Dead series, but not as a zombie. You play two different human beings yeah. in these films. <laughs> yes, if you want to call them that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, right. I did. Yeah. Uh, the first one I had. <laughs> the first one in Dawn was a mistake. I mean, it was um, they needed somebody on the roof, and so they just uh, Savini grabbed me and put me in this bad makeup, and up on the roof I went, you know, as one of these gang members. I had to apologize this morning for it because the uh, character <laughs> that I'm playing is a little on PC, you sure, know, in sure. terms of the makeup. <laughs> good on you for that. Right, good on you for that. In 2021, it makes my heart happy to hear an actor say that. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Um, well, so, I, this is a question that I had last that I thought about last night as well. D and Dawn, you're an antagonistic character. Yeah. Do you prefer that, or do you prefer like playing more of a protagonist? Or a I hero? have I have no I have no preference one way or the other. You know, um, I'm I always hope to work with a good script. You know, so whether it be a movie or a play, um, it's really about you know it's about the writer. To be yeah, honest, sure, sure, and you know, I had a great one in George. Of course, he did. And, yes, and so uh, uh, I was very fortunate. You know, I just consider myself lucky. And you got to play those two different sides. Like right in, in day, you were you know on the rooftop trying to kill people, but or in dawn you were. Yeah. But in day, you know, you're you're Fisher, the scientist who. Yeah. who I, when I was talking to you yesterday, I was saying he's one of one of the very few characters in the of the dead movies that is sort of zero percent asshole. <laughs> right, like, because I feel like you have to be a percentage of asshole to survive that long. Right, but right. like Fisher is the scientist who's still holding on to like, you know, we can find a cure. We yeah. don't have to kill each other. You know, we don't have to go down to the basement and feed each other to zombies if we don't yeah. have to. Yes, right. He was, tries to be the voice of reason. Sure. You yes. know. Which is where Which there is, is sort no of a reason. funny statement in that setting. Like, okay, so there's a voice of reason here? Like, <laughs> like, all right. Well, the truth of the matter for me, I think that Rhodes was probably right, yeah. you know? <laughs> get the hell, let's get the hell out of here sure. and stop messing around, you know? In a post-apocalyptic scenario, like, the military is the only thing you have left that has any semblance of order. So, yes, like, exactly. Rhodes was kind of right. Yeah. But I, take I, away I the leadership and you have them running rampant on their own and you get the scenarios we get in this film. Yeah, yeah true. So right. th let's talk about the experiences on that film, playing a character like Fisher and playing across from like, I mean, I consider the villain of Day of the Dead to be an iconic villain. He, he's, you love to hate him, right? Yeah. yeah right. So just a little bit about working on that film. Oh, Joe was, and Joe was great in it. Joe was yeah. absolutely yeah. great. It was such a good choice uh, of characters for him, you know. Yeah, he was terrific. And it was a it was a horrific death. It was, <laughs> it was so and, satisfying. And one of Savini. Like everything that this dude is is just being ripped apart, both Eat physically it. and metaphorically. <laughs> yes. Choke on it. And he's like, Choke on yeah, oh, it's so good. And that kill is man. Like I said earlier to you, that I just think Tom Savini was on top of his game. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. So uh, what what was it being around like Tom Savini's working at that level? Well, Tom. I met I met Tom in Martin because he's in Martin as well, he, and um, so that's where that's where we met. And um, he actually went down and took George his portfolio to audition for Martin, and George had already cast me. And so Tom missed out. <laughs> well, he's also, he was a theater actor as well, right? Yes, like Tom he was. was another one with from, a background yeah, in theater. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think yeah. that's where he started doing makeup, was that he was an actor but also got really into yeah. makeup or really yeah. into makeup as well. I think, too, his experience in Vietnam uh, gave him plenty yeah. of uh, yeah. background information about... And, and how lucky are we that he had 
makeup as an avenue to sort of deal with some of the trauma of Vietnam. Right, right. Right? Like, right. And that's a lot of what you see, in his, especially in his earlier work. You yeah, see somebody yeah. who really understood what gore and carnage looked like. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was really at the top of his game. And, you know, Rick Baker, I think, was one of his idol. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and um, so, and it was at a time when makeup was handmade, yep. you know? Yeah. Yep. There was no animation. There was no, yeah. you know, none of that's, that. That's real movie magic to me yeah, still. You know, exactly. like it's tricks of the camera, like yeah. in camera tricks. And it was also Greg Nicotero's uh, day, was Greg Nicotero's first outing. And he was a disciple, you know, of Tom. If you look at who Nicotero is now, yeah. that's how you get there, is just yeah, by exactly. eating, eating and breathing everything makeup from those guys. He was a kid in Dawn of the yeah. Day. I mean, day, of yeah, the day. Oh, yeah. yeah, And there's all those stories about him being on the set of Creep Show and just not even having a job, just hanging sort of around. hanging around as like a 15-year-old. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up Father's Day. Yeah. One of our favorite segments from Creep Show ever. So I actually, uh, on the back of my car, I have a Creep Show sticker. Oh, cool. And I can't tell you how many times at stoplights, somebody like motions for me to roll the window down. I roll it down, and they start screaming your lines. They start oh, yeah. screaming, Bedelia, my where's my cake, Bedelia? <laughs> yeah. It's just this unspoken True. connection like between Creep Show fans. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, there was another actor that actually played him, John Lormore who was not too well, as I understand it, during the filming. Yeah. Was he the old man before he died? Yeah, he was the, yeah. Banging his cane, demanding his cake. Exactly, and if you notice in the movie, he's, he's on screen only by himself. He's never with another, oh, yeah. he's never with another actor because he, he was unwell. Oh, and wow. So they were shooting him all by himself. And then inserting him into the yeah. It is all flashbacks. Yeah, him, yeah. And he sort of he uh, he passed away not too long after Creep Show came out. Oh wow. Which was a real shame. He, I never got to meet him, so I think they even shot him somewhere else. Interesting. Yeah. So and so we obviously you're the father's the father once he comes back and it, talk talk about the makeup a little bit like what is that a full body costume mixed with prosthetics? Almost. Because you're going to be in that look <laughs> later today, am I right? Yeah, I mean. Almost. He was uh, Tom. Again, did the makeup obviously for 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 it. I sat under, I sat under plaster for about a week of you know hands, head, chest, and then uh, I went away for a month. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Tom, during that time, worked his magic and created this suit. Uh, and and headpiece and and so when I came back to shoot it was all set it was all ready to go and they just but put you in the suit and put you in the ground that was it that's how it worked yeah. and then you just crawl out and I'm guessing you probably didn't even deliver those lines right yeah, no I didn't um, I think I got to say one when he's walking away at the very end I think I said the last something. I want my cake or some damn thing. Well, when you're holding the, the severed head cake? Uh, before that. Before that. Uh, yeah, well, at, right after I think I kill Ed Harris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, we have to note his amazing dancing in that film. Oh. Right? <laughs> but, no. I think what makes this dancing amazing is it is so uncharacteristic of anything Ed Harris has done since then. Like, he did that one role where he's Very silly, and then so, everything yeah. after that is just like this hard-as-nails, uh, yeah. badass guy. Very much so. Yeah. I was lucky to work with Ed, too, in Night Riders. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which was his only... Only his second feature. Yeah. So, um, really is a sweetheart. And I did... I played Timothy Hutton's twin... Uh, double in the dark hat. Oh, okay. And uh, I mean, I'm never on screen, sure. but I was his act, acting partner the, when he had to talk to himself. So. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Which, of course, yeah. that has to be, yeah, you have to figure out some way to act across Amy from yourself. Amy Madigan was in, and she's a doll baby. Yes. Oh, absolute doll well, and baby. What a fantastic and underrated actor she is, too. Oh, I think so. Uh, she has so. real chops. She and, really uh, does. Yeah. Well, and dude, I love, I didn't know that about you in Dark Half. I love that you have Savini DNA. You have Stephen <laughs> King DNA. Like, 
That's yeah. our wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah. I, hear I mean, you. and you've got Creep Show DNA, which is the ultimate blend of Romero and Stephen yeah, King. Yeah, there you right? go. You know? Right. And right, so, right. And Steve was supposed to have been hanging around set. Was he hanging around when you guys he were was, shooting at all? Yeah, he was. A really cool guy. Really oh, nice yeah. guy. And also in Night Riders. Yeah. Oh, Because okay. he was a vendor or something in Night Riders. Yeah. Oh, you can cameo. find, yeah. if you look at Night Riders, you will see a ton of actors that have been in other George, of George's films. Yeah. We at that time in the late 70s and 80s, we were like a repertory company. You know, yeah. the same people coming back, playing different roles, and, and we were all happy to do it. I mean, Night Riders for me was like summer camp. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, 10 weeks of play um, and yes. getting paid for. <laughs> and what but I that's love that because I didn't have to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love that you brought up that Romero likes to reuse the same people because this is something I've said on the show numerous times. I love directors who do that because it really yeah. speaks to how they build a bond with their crew and their cast. Uh, his crew uh, are amazing, was amazing. I mean, Mike Gornick was with him since Martin he started doing yeah. cinematography. Right. In fact, George was set up to uh, both direct and shoot Martin. And uh, our first day uh, of work, um, he had the camera set up and ready to go. We were walking along. I was walking along the train tracks. And uh, he turned to Mike and said, do you want to shoot this? And yeah. Mike said, yeah. <laughs> And so Mike was the cinematographer from that point on. Sure. Yeah, you know? If it works, it works, and right? It was the first time George felt like he was a director. Sure. Mm. You know? Okay, yeah. One of the, the facts I always love to come back to with Romero is that one of his first jobs ever was working for Fred Rogers. And yeah. that was like a yeah. big thing in the Pittsburgh scene yes. because Rogers was like him in the yes. sense that he wanted local people. And it's so wonderful and surreal to connect those two people because seemingly they're at the opposite end of the spectrum but they really weren't right they yeah. really they really were sort of the same breed of person they really and I think were. that if you start talking to people that knew Romero they all tell the same kind of stories about him that people told about Fred Rogers that yeah. he's he's a sweetheart at his core and like Doll one baby. of the most loving and just the, the giving directors ever and I love that Rogers was sort of his low key mentor in that yeah. regard that just yeah. be nice to everybody there's no reason not to exactly. yeah mentor with just without exactly. all the fake blood well Roger uh, uh, Mr. Rogers um, floor manager uh, was on George's crew yeah. uh, Bamba um, Nicky Tallow yeah. oh okay yeah uh, great guy and and worked on everything after that yeah. with him you know, well, uh, there's, there's interviews you can watch of Romero talking about working for Fred Rogers where, like, Rogers knew what Romero was doing with his career and encouraged him. He was yes, like, well, yeah, I don't absolutely. like horror, but yeah. you you follow your dreams, George. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. <laughs> well, that's the indie film spirit, right? And that's what George Romero, as big as his films were, that's what he was. He was an independent filmmaker at his core. So, I mean, I, that's what I love about it. really meant independent. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no one told him what to do. Because how many times did the studios say to Romero, it's like, listen, we'll give you a lot of money if you want to make a PG-13 or less money for R. And Romero's just like, give me less money. Money. Just yeah. give me less money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, He's about the art. He, he had a vision of every script he wrote. I think he was strongest when he was writer, director, you know. Yeah. He, and he was a tremendous editor. A real. Oh, yeah. And I, think, and I think you could probably attest to this as a writer and a director, Jordan, that, like, when you have the, when you have the vision from beginning to end, there's something cohesive about that. Right, that well, yeah, they always say like there's the film you write, there's the film you make, and then there's the film you get, right? And 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 I think you can at least minimize that shift when the vo voice is singular. Yeah. Like, if you have someone like Romero who's like wrote it and directed it, you know, it's going to stray less than if you get a writer, sells it to somebody else who directs it, who then brings their vision into it, and then maybe a third person edits it, and maybe the whole thing takes a different tone. But if you have someone like Romero that can take it from concept to completion then you can keep that, that streamlined well, idea. He, he edited Martin, and it, it, there was an original version that has long since been lost. Somehow, somewhere. Oh, yeah. Nobody can seem to track it down <laughs> or where it ended up. 
Well, they just released like the the quote unquote other lost Romero film, didn't they? Uh, amusement uh, Park. Yeah, but it's that's just, not even a real. That was like a. It's just had a new release. Yeah, and that wasn't even like a hard no, fictional thriller. Was, that was it like it was actually a PSA. Yeah, it was like a corporate film for why not to lose track of your like for senile ages. old people. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. It's really, <laughs> yeah, but even in that, it's really off putting. Like I watched it and I was yeah, like, yeah, this is upsetting. It is off putting. <laughs> <It is off-putting. laughs> like, <off-putting. laughs> because it's basically an old yeah. man that is suffering from senility has yeah. like a fever dream, and yeah. that's the plot of the movie. That's kind of terrifying. It kind of yeah. it kind of reminds me. If you get a chance, you should watch this movie because it's beyond bizarre. It's called Escape from Tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. So that. it's it's a film they shot entirely in Disneyland without Disneyland's permission yeah. because they <laughs> shot it. Like gorilla shot. They like shot it on like DSLRs and everybody was mic'd up and nobody knew. And it's a story about a man who brings his family to Disney- Disneyland and then goes through like a psychedelic trip oh, about wow. like his position in society and his family. But it's all shot gorilla style and it's like oh, the wow. fact that it exists at all is really just like what makes it kind of special <laughs> how yeah, they made yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, our, our buddy who just walked up to your table brought up your photo op you're doing later. So you're getting into the Creep Show Father's Day outfit. How long is that going to take? That's what they tell me. I have no I have no idea. <laughs> They're really it's, just uh, uh, dragging it, along. It's huh? people that, uh, uh, young women I think that have uh, graduated from uh, Savini's School, Savini uh, school, a makeup school. Uh, so again, we're keeping that so Savini I, DNA alive. I, I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know? that school's going great guns. Yes, they they do great work. Yeah. And you know what's funny? We I said earlier that you're like the only human who appears twice. The only other human I know of that appears twice in a Romero of the Dead movie is Savini, because yes. he appears again in Land of the Dead theoretically as the zombie of his character from Dawn of the Dead. So it's really just you and Savini who get, because Romero is not into crossover characters. Not too much. <laughs> but, I mean, that's sort of one of the brilliant things about what Romero did, right? Is that every decade or so, he would reinvent the zombie film based on what was happening socially at the time. That's, and, like, that's, that's something true. we talked about yesterday, about the, the social subtext to everything yeah. that he did. That and everything. There was always yeah. a deeper meaning to it. Yeah. Which, as a horror fan and as somebody who tries to be as progressive as possible, that shit's really important. Like, well, he was just super smart, yeah. you know. Yeah, I'm very attuned to yeah. you know what's going on in the world, and a heavy duty reader, and you yeah, know, he's a smart guy. So, um, I, yeah, his stuff always was um, yeah. socially. Uh, he understood the social dynamics yep. of the yeah. time. Yeah. Yes, he definitely. Fearless. When you think about the things he was saying, not even like under the rap saying the no, things no, that no. the statements he would make with those movies at the time he was fucking fearless and yeah. like i wish there were more young indie filmmakers out there now that were that kind of fearless with their statements because like he took on things like racism and like we said earlier the military industrial complex consumerism yeah long before it was popular to do that right I think about right. the first act of dawn of the dead uh, like how rough is that scene still to watch to this day when the, when the and it's not even zombies it's the police yeah. busting into the house and how they treat the human beings and yeah, how, like right. what's a zombie what's a human do they care yeah yeah right or even the statement made by Dawn of the Dead that about consumerism right that yeah they're, for sure. they they gravitate towards the mall because yeah. that's where they felt the safest right. and it's like wow that's it's a heavy concept to think about, man. It's not even subtle, right? But it's but it's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Correct. the place where we spend money is the place where we feel the safest because that's what American society trains us to do. And it's yeah, it just makes me happy to know that like that's what we got to grow up on, and it gives me, it inspires me to try and instill that in a younger generation. You yeah. know what I mean? And I do. Yeah. So, what was your favorite experience working with George? I mean, there's so many films. Was there when you look back? And you really think about what was like the best time working with George um, Romero? You know, I, I, honestly, I have to say it was Martin. Martin, I, I okay. really do. I I was very fortunate um, to first of all be considered and then to be cast. Um, and of uh, it 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 was a it was going to school for me, you know, in terms of learning how to be an actor on film. And what to do and how to get it done without, you know, BS. <laughs> George never gave gives a whole bunch of direction. He's very good about allowing the actor to find his or her own way through the process. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, so having that kind of freedom and latitude. 
and then him saying that was great, <laughs> you know, was very, you know, uh, supportive for, uh, you know, a 27-year-old kid who, who was doing this for the first time and um, was able to get through it. So it was really a satisfying process for me. Yeah, and that's a very important relationship between like a, well, a director and a lead actor, first of all, but a, yeah. a, a, an actor who's coming to a feature film for their first role, yeah. you really need the director yeah. to guide you through that. Right. Right, so right. I guess it's lucky for you to have someone as experienced and as wonderful as George Romero to guide you through that first process. Well, look, I mean, you know, Martin was shot close to 45 years ago. Um, it's still talked about. Yeah. It's still in the realm of, of, of the world today. Yeah. You know, um, and, and all of these films, they continue to be talked about, continue to be shown. Um, there's not that many movies out there that that are able to hold on to that kind of time. Yeah, I think a lot of them just happen to be Romero films. A lot of those earlier Romero films that aren't dawn, that aren't Night or Dawn or Day. Right. Things like The Crazies, Season of the Witch, Martin. Like I feel like every 15 years or so, they get rediscovered by a new generation of yeah, people. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I know that. Um, good friend of mine just saw The Crazies recently for the first right. time and was like, how did I fucking miss this movie? And I was like, I don't know, dude. That movie's amazing. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know how you missed it. But, yeah, yeah. But Martin's another one that, like, it's just such a heavy-hitting film for such an under-the-wraps film. So. Yeah, right. Definitely. Weird, well, right? John, we appreciate you so much carving out some time to chat with us. It's been so much fun. My absolute pleasure. Do you have a website or anything that we can direct people to? Is there a johnamplis.com or anything? Uh, there is. A, 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 yeah, but there's... Okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's on the web. You know what it's it is? It's you. a voiceover website. But there is a filmography on it, and there is, uh, it's uh, www.johnamplisofficial.com. Cool. And as always, we'll post links to that in our X file section on our website send, so people can send find it. Send it to it. my Facebook. Okay. Perfect. Absolutely. Everything goes to Facebook. It's okay. easier for me. Sure. I, I understand Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. It's, it's streamlined. Friendly. It, so for like, me, anyway. For and I allow no political BS there on There you go. <laughs> then I'll definitely friend you on Facebook then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. We hope you have fun at the getting in the creep show look and doing the photo op later. Oh, guys, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.